to introduce our guest tonight. He will share his story. Uh, Shane Antar. Thank you for having me here. The topic, of, the topic of crime is very easy to offend people when discussing the topic of crime. Because we're going to discuss some very, very uh, unflattering things about human behavior. We're not going to discuss morality here. That you can get from your ethics professors. My goal here is to take you into my world. And I warn you, some of the discussion here may be offensive to some. We can't help it. I'm going to have scenes from various movies to illustrate certain points that contain four-letter words. But for, in order for you to really understand fraud awareness, you have to get into my world, into my mind. This is not a happy ending story. This is not a story that's going to make you feel that Sam Antar is remorseful or worthy of redemption. Both of which I am not, because the only reason why I'm here is because I got caught. Had I not gotten caught, I'd still be doing it today, maybe even bigger than Madoff. So, to begin, I'm going to take you into the movies. How many people know who, who Rodney Dangerfield is? Okay. And how many people ever saw the movie? Ah, uh, blah, 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 bio, who cares about that? Anyway, we'll get into that later. But how many people ever saw the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield? All right, for those who didn't, to set the scene, Rodney Dangerfield is a dad, and his son is going to college. And the dad follows his son to college, and this is his first class in business. Well, 
pretty much the state of education as it relates to fraud is fantasy land. You're taught in college about debits and credits, about consolidations, about procedures. You're taught skills to better yourselves in the future, but you're not taught enough about how you're going to be screwed over by people like me. You're not taught about the techniques that are used by people like me to take advantage of you. And when you go out there and you do run into people like me, you will get defrauded. You will lose money. Your careers will be destroyed. And that college, unfortunately, doesn't prepare you for. So you're lucky here that your school invited a member of the criminal element like myself. So let's start. Let's talk about ethics. Let's talk about morality. One of the few times I'll use the word tonight. Every person in this classroom, every single person here, is capable of being like me. Can one person here raise their hand and say that they are completely without sin, have not broken any law, have not, have not violated any university policy whatsoever? Can any person here say that? No. Otherwise, what would we need religion for? What would we need government for? What do we need laws for? They exist to regulate behavior, correct? So for all of us here, the very fact that nobody here can raise their hand and say that they were out sin, for all of us here, ethics is truly a matter of convenience. You're ethical when it works for you, and that could be works for you morally, works for you religious-wise, or whatever works for you financially, and you're unethical when it pleases you. The reality is, and studies have shown, that anybody here can be like me. Now, one of the studies that I cite, and I disagree with it because it has that 10% of the people are purely ethical. You'll call them the pious ones. I think it's probably like 1%. But pretty much 80% of our population, or even 90% if I am correct, are situationally ethical. We choose which rules are going to keep and which rules are going to break. In this category here, you'll get the one-time criminals. The people that never planned on a career in crime, never planned on ever committing a crime during their entire lives. But things like pressure, things like getting in with the wrong crowd, things like um, greed, well, it pushes them over. It overpowers them and makes them into criminals. And amongst that 80% of the population, or 90% of the population, things like fear of humiliation, embarrassment, um, fear of prison, things like that might work. Ethics classes might work with, those, with that crowd. But then you get to the top 10% here, the hardcore criminal. That's where I come from. For us, crime is a way of life. It's not just about the money. It's just we, we do our crimes simply because we could. For us, there's no such thing as humiliation. Going to jail is like you getting an MBA. Doing hard time is like a PhD. We're not embarrassed to talk about our accomplishments. We don't feel humiliated by it. And in this group over here, that top 10%, you'll find organized crime groups like the Mafia. You'll find terrorist groups like ISIS. It's a culture. It's a culture of crime, or it's a culture of terror. We call it what you may, but these people are not worried about humiliation, embarrassment. Otherwise, why would terrorists blow themselves up with, 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 along with hostages like they did with Fran in France? It's a completely different mindset. And this is the mindset that we're going to concentrate on. The 10% unethical. Where I came from. And maybe still am. Anybody see the movie Wall Street, The Money Never Sleeps? Anybody see that movie? Gordon Gecko? There's one important lesson that people need to understand. Is that not all economic crime is economically motivated. 
Some criminals don't always do it just for the money. It's part of it, but it's not the entire reason that they commit their crimes. So here's some advice from Gordon Gecko. Is there a way to make this ladder? You can cut out that scene out of the video. And what is that game? What is that game between people that financial felons play? Before we get into details about the game, I want to bring you to the greatest financial felon, the greatest white collar criminal, the greatest blue collar criminal, the greatest criminal of all time, the devil himself. Anybody see the movie with Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves called The Devil's Advocate? Anybody unfamiliar with that movie? It's about Ke Keanu Reeves is a lawyer. He's a former prosecutor. He goes to work for a law firm not knowing that it's actually run by the devil himself, Satan himself. And he has this confrontation with his boss about morality, about the daily things that you subject yourselves to, the temptations, whether you can hold back or act upon your temptations. And this is the devil's interpretation of humanity, the vulnerability of human beings. devil calling himself a humanist may be the last humanist. You see, white collar criminals are fans of man. Your vulnerabilities as human beings, your decency as human beings, makes our jobs easier. In fact, the more decent you are, the more vulnerable you are. Let me give you an idea. There are various things which are known as exploitable weaknesses. And we use a combination of persuasion and deceit in order to achieve our objectives. We prey upon your psychological and cognitive vulnerabilities. And the first rule that we go by is, is that we consider your humanity, your needs, whether it's financial, whether it's, um, whether, whether it's um, how can I say it, um, whether it's emotional, your trust your ethics, your morality, even your good nature as weaknesses to be exploited in the execution of our crimes. Trust, giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. What is the basis of our system of justice? The presumption of innocence. With that presumption of innocence comes a degree of trust. The government cannot come into my apartment 
and just say, I believe that Sam Antar is running a bomb factory. It's got to have probable cause. So the criminal, even the terrorists, will always have the initiative to execute their crimes. It's a cost of a free society. The freer the society, the easier it is for criminals to roam free. That's the debate that's going on in, about terrorism today. How much of your personal freedoms, your personal privacy, are you willing to give up to make it easier for customer, easier for the government to go after criminals or even terrorists? And we take advantage of those freedoms that you enjoy today. Trust. While you're trusting, we're executing. We will always have the initiative. Your morality. You choose your moral compass. And in choosing your moral compass and your ethical compass, you agree to limit your behavior. Me as the hardcore white collar criminal, I have no limitations on my behavior. So those limitations themselves put you at a weakness. The second rule is, and this goes back to a political saying that Tip O'Neill, Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House under Ronald Reagan, when Ronald Reagan was President. He was a Democrat, Reagan was a Republican. And Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. And I'm saying to you today that all white collar crime is personal. The white collar criminal measures their effectiveness by the comfort level of our victims. If I'm creepy, if I make you uncomfortable, are you going to believe my lies? Ladies, how many ladies have gone out on dates over here? You all better raise your hands. When a guy is trying, what is a guy trying to do on the first date? Besides get into your pants. <laughs> He's trying to make you feel comfortable, right? Right? So he can get to date number two. He can't get to, in, to first base, right? Unless you like him. Well, the white collar criminal is similar to the guy seeking a date with a female. Except we're not looking to get into your pocketbook. Uh, we're not looking to get into your pants. We're just looking to get into your pocketbooks. We use the same techniques. Ask yourselves in your personal and professional lives how often You've been disappointed by the people you've trusted, the people you liked. Who more than to put yourself in a position of vulnerability than somebody that you like? So most white collar criminals, the most effective ones, are always kind and gentle in this sick, twisted way to their victims. In other words, you can't get your victims to believe you lies unless they like you first. So we have to gain your trust, we have to gain your likability before we can even think about taking advantage of you. The third rule is, is that we fabricate false integrity to gain the trust of our victims. Pediophiles. What is the profession? What is the craft? What work is often associated with pediophiles? Priests. You say, why, why are so many priests pediophiles? Is it the Catholic Church's fault? Is it because under Catholicism, priests can't have sex and they do it with little boys or little girls? No. The reason that pediophiles are often found, not just in the Catholic Church, it gets most of the publicity, but you find them amongst pastors, amongst rabbis, amongst clerics, is because that position gives them a certain degree of stature where their actions are less likely to be questioned. So all white collar criminals, or at least the best of them, always seek stature, positions of respect, because a society, a society loves people of stature. They'll be overt givers, they'll give money to charity. How often do we hear about the the, the, the head of the Boy Scout troop abusing little boys. Again, positions of stature and positions of power.
Okay. How many here, people remember this song from the 1970s? Pro probably these kids were not even in diapers yet. So ask yourselves, how many of you people have been fooled by smiling faces? I know as a criminal that you can't lie without a smiling face. You always got to smile at your victims. You get more stealing with a smiling face than you can with a gun. So who are these white collar criminals? How do we sort them out? How do you find the Sammy Antars, the Bernie Madoffs, the Dennis Kozlowskis, the criminal element of the world? Well, pretty much it's not that easy. You see, according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, it's a professional organization of about 50, 60, 70,000 professionals, comprised of CPAs, uh, IIA, uh, IIAs, whatever, all of those three-letter uh, credentials. Um, they do studies on occupational fraud every two years. And consistently from study to study, they find that 95% of, of criminals have no previous criminal record, and only 13% have ever been charged with any crime in the past. So it's nearly impossible to find the white-collar criminals amongst us. It's not like television where you can easily profile a white collar criminal because most of us exhibit the same traits as our politicians. We kiss babies and we steal their candy. And if you look at some of the major crimes of the last century, Enron, Ken Lay, he didn't have a criminal record. Bernie Ebers, WorldCom didn't have a criminal record. Dennis Kozlowski, Tycho didn't have a criminal record. And the mother of all fraudsters, or I should say the father of all fraudsters, Bernie Madoff, didn't have a criminal record. And all of these guys were committing crime for years before they got caught. And of course, my former boss and myself, my co-partner in crime, Eddie Antar. We were all honorable men. We were all, to the rest of the world, law-abiding citizens. We all appeared to be charitable. We all appeared to be likable. But the reality is these were just mere tools in order to advance our crimes. Well, that was my company, Crazy Eddie's. We were a discounter. So we sold discounted consumer electronics. It was known as a specialty retail chain. We sold only electronics. It's kind of like the Apple store today, back in those days. And we did it well. We plastered the New York metropolitan area with all kinds of ads, corny ads like this. And in the process of doing it day and night, we had better name recognition than Coca-Cola. Everybody thought of us as a discounter. If you ever read about some company doing deep discounting, they automatically, even the press today, uses the word Crazy Eddie prices. But Crazy Eddie's being a discounter was purely a fiction. 
We were purely a game of smoke and mirrors. What we projected to the outside world was completely different to what we projected, to what we were doing inside. And in order to get into the topic of crazy eddies, you have to understand the hierarchy of crime. You got the criminals, and then you have the victims. But the most important part of committing any crime are the enablers in the middle. Has anybody had any experience dealing with people with drug addiction? And one of the things you learn is not to be an enabler. Because if you're an enabler to a drug addict, they will take advantage of you. You think you're helping them out, you think you're loving them, but they're just taking advantage of you in order to get their next fix. Give them $5 to buy a meal, instead of buying them a meal, and that $5 won't go to the meal. In white collar crime, we have the same thing, enablers in the middle. Who are those enablers? Number one is auditors. No white collar, a lot of you are in accounting school, no white collar criminal. Let's put it this way, no corporation in America, whether it's a corrupt corporation or not, hires auditors for the work that they do, for the quality of work that they do. They're hired for one reason and one reason only, in order to gain the easiest path to a clean audit opinion. And if we can fool the auditors, who are supposedly independent third parties, right? That gives us, that gives us the level of trust amongst the general population in order to fool our victims. Another enabler is the media. Media attention, especially positive media attention, will gain us a level of false integrity. Anybody see the movie, not, not, not the movie, the show, Saturday Night Live? Okay. Many of you are not old enough, but Dan Aykroyd used to be on Saturday Night Live. Now, you saw that Crazy Eddie commercial with Jerry Carroll, this, this, and that with the thing? Now, watch this. You see, these ads, these crazy eddy ads became so popular that the media started spoofing us. Shows like Saturday Night Live. There was even a scene in the movie Splash, a blockbuster movie Splash, where the mermaid goes into a Bloomingdale's and Jerry Carroll pops almost out of the screen. And that gained us implied credibility. It humanized the inhuman acts that were going on behind the scenes at Crazy Eddie's. It made us likable to the general population. Why do you think every politician wants to be on Saturday Night Live? To humanize themselves to potential voters. Poke fun at me. It's OK. And when you laugh with them, whether you know it or not, they're laughing at you. Because as people were laughing at, Saturday, at the scene that Saturday Night Live did, we were laughing at our victims. So, you need enablers. It's not just to con the victims. It's not just your job to con your victims, but it's also 
jo your job to win over enablers because they give you more respect amongst your potential victims. You see, we were not your accidental criminals. We were not the one-timers. We were not the situ situationally ethical people that, for us, ethics was a matter of convenience. We were hardcore criminals. For us, we considered ethics a matter of weakness, not convenience. That was our mindset. We set out to commit fraud from day one. The whole purpose of Crazy Eddie's, from day one, if there were to be a charter that was written that would be the truth, was to commit crime. Was to screw over people and commit crime. 
And you start off with small. You start off in small ways. Back in the 1960s, consumer electronics was fair traded. What, I'm, what I mean by that is, is that manufacturers were allowed to set the price at the retail level of how much retailers could charge for their product. So hypothetically, if I'm Apple, you can only sell that iPhone for $700. You discount it, I'm not going to ship you any more product. And they were allowed to do it as anti-competitive as you may think it is today. The reason behind that was so that every retailer could make the same profit. And everybody would go home at the end of the day and remain profitable. But early on, before this massive advertising campaign, Eddie was a mom and pop retailer trying to make its way as a business. And we could not compete with the major chains who had large advertising budgets at the time because, again, we were just starting out. And the larger chains with the huge advertising budgets were putting the small retailers like Crazy Eddie out of business because we couldn't compete on price even though we had the efficiencies to charge less. And they had the huge advertising budgets to draw the customers in. And mom and pop stores like Crazy Eddie were failing. And my cousin goes on two tracks to beat the system. The first track is he starts discounting consumer electronics. And the manufacturers go after him, and he fights them in court, and he wins the battle, and he gets fair trade abolished. That makes him, in the eyes of the consumer and in the eyes of the world, a retailing revolutionary, a real discounter. But how does he accomplish it? You see, we have to go back in time to the era. Late 60s, now it's the early 70s. Back then, we didn't have internet. Back then, People weren't carrying 20 pieces of plastic or Apple Pay or whatever, or Google, Google Pay in their wallet or s cell phones. Back in those days, most people paid in cash. Credit cards was a convenience, but most people pretty much paid in cash. Now, does Georgia have a sales tax? And how much is it? If I am doing purely cash sales, right? and I don't disclose those cash sales, I don't declare them, what am I gaining off the top by skimming? 7%, right? And if you examine the financial statements of almost every American corporation, 7% operating profit, that's sales minus cost of goods sold minus operating expense, most of them don't even work on a 7% operating profit. So it's a huge number when you consider all factors. So in Crazy Eddie's world, in our world, most, if not all, of the cash sales were skimmed. That gave us what? That 7%, that sales tax. Then when you take that cash and you pay people, it's known as off the books, cash instead of, instead of on the books, right? What else do we save? Payroll taxes, right? And if you buy from other vendors with that cash, it's got this it's got this uh, domino effect. You're saving money all around. So the way that Crazy A's was able to survive as that discount that everybody painted us as was by stealing the sales tax. Back in those days, and even to an extent today in our internet or, 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 or digital economy, sales tax is a license to steal, especially if you're in the cash-based business. Uh, today we have the internet retailers like Amazon, Overstock, right? We have the internet retailers. What gives them the advantage over the brick and mortars? Sales tax. The, unlike us who were stealing the sales tax and using some of it to subsidize and give the consumer, um, give the consumer a, a discount, they just don't simply collect the sales tax. They leave it up to the consumers to voluntarily pay the tax. But it's the same advantage we had the same advantage as the internet retailers had have today, except we were stealing some of the sales tax in order to be a, give us the leverage to discount to consumers. 
And most customers that walk into a Crazy Eddie store never walk out with the product that they originally intended to purchase. Maybe 80 to 90% of the customers that looked for, what is this, an iPhone? Yeah. Would end up buying a Samsung, so to speak. Now, we didn't have these kind of, this kind of product in those days, but I'm just using for illustration. We had what was known as a bait and switch policy. You walk in for, say, a Sony, and this first person who waits on you is called the SW man. Switch the customer, SW for switch the customer. If he can't succeed in switching the customer to a more profitable purchase, the TO guy, TO, take over the sale. And finally, we had the NAD guy, he was known, the acronym the NAD meaning nail that door guy, in order to take a final shot at the customer. So we had three shots at a customer before they walked out with the product that they intended to purchase. And even if they got it at a discount, how was the discount subsidized? Sales tax. Stealing the sales tax. If the merchandise wasn't in stock, we'd repackage merchandise as brand new. And eventually we go on to things like insurance fraud and other frauds. But that will be in later slides. So it becomes a retailing revolutionary. He, in the eyes of the public, Crazy Eddie's is a law-abiding citizen. But behind the scenes, we're building a criminal enterprise from day one. 
And how do you build that criminal enterprise? First of all, you need people that you can trust even within the criminal organization. So even there, a degree of trust is always involved. What do all organized crime groups and all terrorist groups have in common? Can anybody give me the three commonalities of all organized crime groups and terrorist groups that keeps them together? Race, religion, and ethnicity. I'm Jewish. You think I can get into ISIS? If you're Italian, you can't even be a made member of the mafia. You have to be Sicilian. There's Eastern European gangs. There's Latino gangs. There's African American gangs. The most successful organized crime groups have that one, that, those three commonalities, race, religion, and ethnicity. It's not just the money that binds them together. It's that heritage, that common shared heritage. So in Crazy Eddie's, at the very beginning, you had to be a member of Eddie Antar's immediate family. The second wave were first cousins, like me, with the last name of Antar. The third wave was non-Antar first cousins. The fourth wave were, it, we were Syrian Jews, you had to be a Syrian Jew. And then the fifth wave was, if we, once we ran out of Syrian Jews, you had to be Jewish. And then when we ran out of family members, Syrian Jews, etc., and Jews, then we went to the Christians. We went to African Americans. We went to Latinos. You could see it's almost like a pyramid. It's almost like a caste system, but that's how most successful organized crimes are, organized, are, are, are built. People are more likely to trust their own than to trust somebody from the outside. That's why if you go to New York City, you'll see Greek neighborhoods, Italian neighborhoods, African American neighborhoods, Puerto Rican neighborhoods, Dominican neighborhoods, Jewish neighborhoods. People like to congregate amongst their own kind. They're more likely to congregate amongst their own kind. So in the early years, you had to be a relative and a family member to be inside the business. And especially as it related to the fraud, again, you had the same hierarchy, that same pyramid with the Antars all the way at the top. Our crime spree involved various phases. There was the phase before we won public, and then there was the phase after we won public. For example, we start out in 1969 and we're skimming money. We described that. We described how the skimming helped make us into a formidable discounter. That was the primary focus on our crimes. Around 1980, we hatch a plan. We're going to go public one day. Now, if you're a public company, does it pay for you to understate your income or overstate your income? Why? Because people are buying your stock, right? Simple, right? Simple math. It pays more to overstate your income and overpay your taxes and screw investors than it does to understate your income, evade taxes, and screw the Internal Revenue Service. Simple economics. I'll give you the math. If I skim a million dollars and there's a 40% tax rate, how much am I evading in taxes? 400,000. If I overstate my income by a million dollars, how much am I overpaying in taxes? 400,000. What's my inflated net income? 600,000. If my stock is trading at, say, 50 times earnings, from that 600,000 in inflated net income, how much more value have I added to my company? $30 million. So by overpaying my taxes by a mere $400,000, right? 
overstating my net income by $600,000, I've inflated the value of my company by how much? $30 million. And if I own most of the stock in the company, doesn't it pay to overpay your taxes so you can screw investors? So in the phase between Crazy Eddie skimming as a private company and going public, we had what was known as the legitimization process. We actually committed securities fraud by going legit. We stopped committing one crime so we can commit a bigger and better crime in the future. So from around 1980 to 1984, we gradually reduce our skimming down to zero. Now, as the CFO of the company, I did keep two sets of books. Let me give you for instance. In 1980, our real income was $4.7 million. Our net profits from skimming was $3 million. Now that's not the full amount of the skimming, that's the net profits. We skimmed maybe 10, 15 million, maybe 20 million, but we paid out expenses in cash. So our real, pro uh, our, our reported profits was 1.7 million. In other words, we really made 4.7 million, right? But because we didn't want to show the money that we made from skimming, the net income from skimming, the public only knew us as making $1.7 million. The next year, we skim a little bit less and a little bit less until finally we get to the year before Crazy A's goes public. Notice how our net income, the income that we report to the rest of the world, almost triples from $4.7 million, $1.7 million, to $4.6 million. Whereas our real income, right, just grew negligibly from 4.7 million to 5.3 million. Our income almost triples in the year, prior, our reported income almost triples in the year prior to going public, whereas our actual income was growing negligibly. And that gave us that growth curve, because if we're growing at 25, 30% a year, we're going to get a higher valuation, a higher PE ratio. Instead of being traded at 10 times earnings, and if we inflate our income, we only get 10 times that number in, in, in uh, phony valuation. We're going to be trading at 50 times earnings. So for every dollar that we can inflate income in the future, we're going to get a bigger uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. So we gradually reduce our skimming in the years prior to going public to zero. Because around 1979, 1980, we didn't know if we were going to go public in 81, 82, 83. It's a process. It would take years in order for us to clean things up. We had people that we were paying off the books. We had to pay them on the books. If you're paying somebody, say, 40 grand a year off the books, you can't just give them a check for 40 grand a year because they're going to net less money after tax. You've got to give them a larger raise to $60,000 a year so they can net the same amount of money that they were netting before. You have to realign your relationships with people that you're buying merchandise for cash. All is during the transition period. So in legitimizing crazy eddies, we're actually getting, we're legitimizing crazy eddies, we're actually committing a securities fraud at the same time. Because in every financial statement that you read with a public company, they have historical comparisons. And investors like to see the numbers growing from year after year. And here, the growth was largely fabricated by just reducing the amount of income tax evasion we were doing each year. And then as a public company, we start inflating our income. The standard things, you can overvalue your assets like inventory, you can understate your liabilities like accounts payable, but the first one here, which is what I want to concentrate, is actually a, very, uh, is actually a combination of the two. Remember, before Crazy Eddies goes public, we're skimming money and evading taxes. In 1986, we were $2 million shy of Wall Street's goal for our sales. Now, what happens if you don't meet Wall Street's expectations? Your stock goes down. So what do we do? 
We take money that we previously skimmed from Crazy Eddie's when it was a private company. And we actually put it back into the company. We launder it back into the company. So that $2 million, right, that we probably evaded $800,000 in taxes on, we go back and put it in the company, pay the taxes that we previously evaded. We have $1.2 million in inflated net income after we pay those taxes. Our stock is trading at, say, 50 times earnings. And our market valuation goes up by $60 million. You get a bigger bang for the buck screwing investors than you do the Internal Revenue Service. It's plain economics. You won't learn that in the economics class. So how do you fool the auditors? What do you do to fool the auditors? Where are the auditors throughout? The first thing you have to learn is never to lie if you can avoid it. You can still commit a fraud, it might sound like, like a conundrum, without lying. If you can get somebody to not ask a question, you don't have to lie. Why does magic seem so real? Because of distraction. You don't really see what's going on there. If I appear to be uncooperative, that's going to raise red flags in your mind that I have something to hide. So the whole technique in dealing with the auditors is, is to stonewall them without them thinking that you're stonewalling them. How do you do it? Well, audits back in my day would take about eight weeks to do. It's kind of like when you go through your semester. By week four out of eight, you should have 50% of the work done and 50% of the work left to do. By week six out of eight, you should have 75% of the work done and 25% of the work left to do. My job was to, by six, week six out of eight, was not for them to have 75% of the work done and 75% of the time and 25% of the work left to do and 25% of the time, was to actually reverse the numbers. They would have 25%, they would have 25 of the work done in the first six weeks and 75% of the work done left to do in the remaining two weeks. So figure it out. I got 25% of the work done, 75% into the time frame of the audit. And I got 75% of the work left to do. I got to do the same, I got to do triple the amount of work in one third the time. And what happens when you rush to do the work? You make mistakes, you make errors, you omit key audit procedures. How, professors, how many students ever give you their assignments early? Right? How many students ever take a test and walk out 20 minutes before the test is done? Now, I'm not saying they're cheating. But I'm just saying to you, human nature is, okay, is to give things the last minute. And if you can just con your auditors into thinking that that's your intention, you're just lazy, you just want to get it, you, you get it to them in the last minute, without them knowing that this is your scheme by design to give them as little time to think, they're not going to think that you're being evasive or obstructing them or stonewalling them. And that's pretty much how we did it. So how do you do it? How do you get the auditors to look the wrong way? How do you connive them? Because you need them. You, they're your enablers. They're your ticket to stealing to inv from investors. Without their clean audit opinion, you can't get anywhere. So how do you do it? Distraction. Has anybody ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket? Now, I warn you, some people might be offended by this, but this is for the purpose of education. This is a movie that was set in Vietnam in the 1960s. It was an award-winning movie. It was a blockbuster movie, a very popular movie. And this is a scene in Saigon with two GIs and a hooker.
Now, I ask you, what was the hooker's intent? To sell them sex or to distract them long enough so her accomplice, her alleged accomplice, could steal the camera? What? Distraction. distraction. Now, a lesson in distraction, Crazy Eddie style.
was the author and example of the merchandise he has got to tell. Then a helpful employee is sent out to count the stacks. She would call down 70 large green TVs. And if you look at that row as the auditor from the ground, you can count 70 boxes. You can see how many there were across and how many there were down. But the entire stack is little more than a facade. The auditor dutifully records the inflated numbers he is given. Antar goes further when he distracts the auditor and alters his inventory tally right on the count sheet. He would take every one and make it a four or a seven, and then give them back their altered papers. And so where they had written down ten, it was now either forty or seven. Even better, the files give any crucial information about the next stores the auditor plans to visit and the sample counts he intends to take. So that's nice to have these poor guys loading up the truck again and driving us for a bit. And they just kept a step ahead of the auditor. <coughs> Enjoy that. The auditor paints a portrait of a thriving company. The Antar is now ready to strike. Armed with 13 apparently successful stores, he sits down to seal the deal with Wall Street. Here were the investment professionals, the Wall Street sharks, thinking they were cleaning up these dumb Brooklyn street guys. And the supposedly dumb Brooklyn street guys are playing them. He was such a larger than life Brooklyn bond that he fooled the crooks on Wall Street into thinking that they were fooling him. With the money he rakes in going public, Antar opens 26 new stores in under three years and quietly cashes out $40 million worth of his own shares. At the annual Crazy Eddie shareholder meeting, he is greeted like a rock star. Eddie came and did the rocky, you know, hands over his head, and the crowd started chanting, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. And at that moment, Eddie Antar was as happy as he ever was. But what Eddie doesn't realize is the magnitude of his success threatened to bring his vast empire to crashing down. I started at Crazy Eddie's. I started at Crazy Eddie's in 1971, two years after the first store opened up. I'm 14 years old, and the family had plans for me. They wanted somebody with a certain degree of financial sophistication if their goals of building a retail giant were realized. And they wanted a family member, and they found it in me. So they subsidized not only my education, they actually pay me, like a salary, like a job, to attend school. And they pushed me to major in accounting, because they wanted somebody with the financial expertise to bring them to the next level, and to the level after that, and to the level after that. They realized, in order to be effective criminals, that you can never cheat yourself out of a good education. And I was an A student, because if I cheated on the tests, how can I be a great criminal financial architect? I had a 4-0 index in accounting, a 3.67 or so index overall, and I aced the CPA exam on the first try with a 90-91 average. Back in those days, only 20% of the people passed the CPA exam in any sitting, and most of that 20% pass it with just a 75 passing grade. And I needed experience to get my license. You know, it's not one thing you pass the CPA exam, you need a couple of years experience. By this time it's around 1979, 1980. And he didn't want me to be contaminated by the outside world. He wanted me to be close to the family. So at this time, Crazy A's is a private company. It's not a public corporation. It's audited by a small accounting firm known as Penn & Horowitz. 
we were 75, we were, I'm sorry, we were 35% of their revenue. So when Eddie asks Penn and Horowitz, can you employ my cousin? Do you think they're going to say no? So they employ me. Now, the intent was to learn audits and please keep me close to the family. The intent was not, as this video implies, to watch them do their audits on Crazy Eddie's. But because Crazy Eddie's was such a huge client of theirs, and they never had enough personnel, I end up actually helping them with audits of Crazy Eddie's. But at the time, it was a private company, and we were a large client of theirs. And the auditors went along. This goes on up until from 1980 to around 1982, 83, about a year before we go public. By this time, around 83, I finished my experience that I required at Penn and Harwood. I can apply for my CPA license, which I got about a year and a half later, right? After all of the paperwork and all of that nonsense. And in 1983, we switched to an accounting firm which is known today as KPMG, one of the big four. Back in those days, it was known as Maine Herdman. So they had an educated member of the family with the financial sophistication, with some experience to play games with the big time guys. The big, in those days it was the big eight, today it's the big four, with the big boys. And me being at the time 27 years old, I knew enough about how guys are and how females are. You see, back in those days, even today, most of the legwork is done by the staff accountants. And their ages are generally between 21 and 30 years old. They do most of the work. They do most of the running around. And if you can contaminate them, you know, there's an old saying, I hate to use the language, but it's appropriate here. The shit rises to the top. The shit that you feed them rises to the audit partner. And if you, and if you can feed them garbage, then the audit partner only gets the garbage that you want them to see. So how do you do it? Well, we've got to go back to, again, now it's 1980s, not 2015. In this room here today, there's maybe 60% females. There were even female professors. Back in my day, there were no female professors. This was a male fraternity, the accounting profession. The few that made it through the ranks were marginalized, made fun of, and minimized. That was the era that we lived in. So most of the time, you're getting young males, single between 21 and 22 and 30 years old, doing most of the legwork on audits. And what is the easiest way to distract a male? A guy. Females. Cleavage, if I may use a blood word. <laughs> so what I always try to do whether the females were involved in the conspiracy or not, was to give the auditors walking in a female counterpart to work with. And they'd spend more time looking at the females than doing their audit work. The tape has it a little bit wrong. It says, I had to arrange for inexperienced auditors to be assigned a job. I didn't. They came packaged with the audits as they do today. And audit work if you can enter accounting, I might as well break it to you now, is boring. It sucks. It's mundane. It's tedious. It is shitty work. It's not the kind of work that you're going to go out to a bar after counting boxes and brag to some lady trying to pick her up. That's not the exciting work that you're going to be able to brag about. So it's very, very easy to distract these young males from doing their job. And year after year, after year, they miss key audit procedures. Effectively, nobody ever climbs over the boxes to see what's really there, the symbolism. Nobody climbs over the boxes to see what's behind the boxes. Whether it was an inventory, whether it was an accounts payable confirming how much money we owed out, whether it was cash in the bank, nobody climbs over the boxes and takes anything to any second level because that's not how we got caught. We didn't get caught because the auditors found anything. 
I never lost an audit. In my entire career as a criminal, I never lost an audit. Every one of the financial statements that I crafted, that I made into artwork, were passed on by the auditors. I was a successful criminal all the way around. So how do I implode? How do we implode? How do most crimes implode? You know, behind every major fraud in this century, it's not just me, was a clean audit opinion. Enron, Tyco, every major fraud had a clean audit opinion, including Bernie Madoff. So audits don't really protect you as much as people would like to think. Now, before I get to the devil, let's go back into taking advantage of human beings. There's that one scene with that one young male audit. And again, it's not really one young male auditor. It's a multitude of male auditors in multiple locations over many years. How did we know he was not going to climb over boxes? As a criminal, you have to know. You have to profile your victims first. Yes, it does involve a degree of prejudice. We're not politically appropriate here, correct here. We profile people to real, look at and see who can we take advantage of and who we can take advantage of. So what was the key to determining, in this case, in this one illustrative instance, why this person could be taken advantage of. Can anybody guess? Well, let's see now. Um, let me see, let me see. Sir, can you please stand up? You with the tie on. What does this gentleman and that young order to have in common? They're both wearing a shirt and a tie. Now, do you wear a shirt and a tie to climb over boxes? I didn't give you permission to sit down yet. OK, you can sit. Or, sir, can you please stand up? Or do you dress like a slob like this guy to climb over boxes? What does it tell you? What does it project to me as a criminal when a guy is dressed so dapper and so well like this student here as opposed to a slob like this student here? What does it tell me about the guy's character? Again, I don't mean to offend, but I'll just say it. His shit doesn't smell. He's got an ego. He feels a certain degree of self-importance and self-esteem. Now to be fair, we all have a degree of self-importance and self-esteem within us. It's called vanity, right? It's called vanity. And when people stroke that self-esteem and make you feel good about yourself, right? You could be very easily manipulated by those people, right? A guy going out on a date with you is going to tell you he's beautiful. you're beautiful, right? Right or wrong? He's not going to say you're dumb. He's not going to say you're ugly, right? He's going to say all kind things about you. He's going to stroke your vanity. He's going to make you feel good about yourself. And in making you feel good about yourself, hopefully he's not going to take advantage of you. Me as the criminal, I'm going to look to take advantage of you as I make you feel good about yourself. It's human nature. We all want people to say nice things about us, right? We all want that pat on the back. It's like that song, Smiling Face, uh, Beware of Smiling Faces, Beware of the Pat on the Back. We all want it, right? So what better than to get this guy not to look, than to give him, to feed the self-esteem that he wants fed, to tell him the nice things about himself. To give him the respect that he feels that he deserves. It goes back to the devil in the movie The Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino. The, the, the very famous last words of the last line that the devil has said. And it actually goes back to the book of Proverbs. What is the devil's favorite sin?
Vanity. Beware of people that treat you kindly. Beware of people that make you feel good about yourselves. I did it all with a smile. I never had to threaten anybody to commit crime. I was the nicest, most gentle criminal in the world, but that didn't make me any less ruthless and any less evil. Now you may have your break with that thing to think about. Thank you. You got 10 minutes. Do we have time for snacks? Do you have snacks? Oh. Thank you. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Stay. Hey. You got a criminal controlling this classroom here. You don't want to screw with me. Go ahead, sir. I'm the vice president of the Nautilus chapter of the Georgia Society of CPAs, and we'd like to present three scholarships tonight. Um, Joe, We were talking about the manipulative, the manipulations, the manipulative behavior of auditors. And I mentioned that I never lost an audit. So how does Crazy Eddie's eventually fall? How do we get uncovered? How do we get unmasked? Well, the same human weaknesses that we exploited amongst the victims, we exhibited ourselves. Wolfert's arrival. 
A business rival soon moves in and buys Crazy Eddie in a hostile takeover bid. But Antar has the last laugh. The new owner quickly discovers the inventory fraud. A staggering $80 million worth of non-existent merchandise. Before police can arrest Eddie on a racketeering charge, he flees to Israel, armed with six passports and access to his stolen millions. Sam is left holding the bag. And I said, why? Well, I'm on my own. I'm on my own. And I decided to come home. With the knowledge gained from Sam, authorities launch an international manhunt for Antar, whose new life on the run is not working out the way he had hoped. You have to think of how big his need was to be noticed, to be admired, to get attention. All of which is completely <coughs> inconsistent with the ground. There's no flashy sports cars, there's no flashy women. He couldn't live that way. You see, what ultimately unravels Crazy Eddie's is not auditors, it's not even really the takeover, but it was the squabbling within the family. You see, when F Crazy Eddie's first starts out, it's financed by Eddie's dad, Sam M. Antar. I'm Sam E. Antar. He was the eldest son of my grandparents. He was the patriarch of the family. He owned one third of Crazy Eddie's along with my cousin, Ronnie Gindy, and my other cousin, Sam M's son, Eddie Antar. Early on, Ronnie Gindy sells out to Eddie Antar, and Eddie Antar owns initially two thirds of a money losing retailer. But as time goes on and he beats fair trade and he starts this massive advertising campaign, Crazy Eddie's becomes a gold mine for the Antar family. And Eddie's dad, and in the early days was looked as the patriarch of the Antar clan. But his son's success overshadowed his dad's patriarchal status. And Eddie, in effect, becomes the de facto patriarch of the Antar clan. And the dad, rather than being proud of his son, grows jealous of his own son. And in 1983, nine months December 31st, 1983, nine months before he goes public, the old man, the government used to call him the old goat, I'll call him the old man. Anyway, the old man hatches a scheme to humiliate his own son in the eyes of the family. And Eddie at the time was a womanizer, cheated on his wife all throughout the years, and the old man wanted his current wife, Debbie One, to catch him with his mistress, Debbie Two, and of all nights, New Year's Eve. And you can imagine the shit hitting the fan. However, that did not immediately unravel the Antar fraud, because it was nine months before we went public, and we still had more fraud to do. What kept us together was the fact that we still haven't screwed over investors. Because as a private company in December 31st, 1983, we may have been valued at about $10, $15 million. But as a public company, by 1987, we could have and did achieve a $500 million market valuation. So whereas we had this religious, ethnic, and racial bond together, that was gone on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1983. The glue that holds the Antar clan together that makes them commit the crimes is simply money at this point. Now, a little bit back in history. From 1970s to 1984, we were making money and understating our income and evading taxes. From 1984 to 1986, our first two years as a public company, we were making money and inflating our reported profits. Now it's 1987, three years after that New Year's massacre. 
By this time, Crazy A's is losing money. Electronics has become commoditized. That TV that you sold for, this is for purposes of illustration, it's not an exactly accurate, but the concept is accurate. That TV that you sold for $300 last year, you're selling for $200 this year. So you've got to do 50% more volume, effectively, approximately, to have the same level of sales. And we just couldn't maintain it with the price declines. So Crazy Eddies is now losing money. And the best I can do is understate our losses and not overstate our profits. And the stock plummets in 1987. It plummets from, say, $500 million in market valuation to about $120 million in market valuation, a 75% decline. But by this time, three years after the New Year's Eve massacre, the family has already milked the cow. They've already cashed out close to $100 million. Their position in Crazy Eddie's was only 4 or 5 or 6% of the company, which made us vulnerable with the stock declining, the family squabbling, to an outsider thinking that he's going to be able to do it better. We hatch a plan. We thought it was a bold move. So Eddie and I hatch a plan with this in mind, with this risk in mind that an outsider would come in. We're going to take over Crazy Eddie's and make it into a private company again. Now what would you say? Why would these guys offer $7 a share, equivalent to, say, $200 million for a company they know is worthless? Right? Why would we do such a thing? First of all, we weren't going to use our own money. The investment bankers promised us 30% of the newly formed Crazy Eddie private company. They were going to put up the capital for us to buy out the investors. So we didn't have to lay out a dime to overpay for this fraud. What we didn't anticipate was that somebody would outbid us for our own fraud. And that's what happens. A lawyer Zinn, who ran a company out of Texas, an electronics wholesaler, thought that he wanted to now get into the retail business. And he bids $8 a share. You have these two competing bids, the Antar clan at 7 and a lawyer Zinn at 8. Both of us eventually couldn't get financing. Couldn't get the backup to buy the company. But Zinn was persistent. Rather than make a tender offer for the company because he couldn't get financing, he partners with an activist investor who was well known in his day, Victor Palmieri, who ran the Oppenheimer Palmieri Fund. And they accumulate enough stock that at the annual meeting, they can vote the Antars out of the company. So for a mere 20 or $30 million, they take over Crazy Eddie's, control of Crazy Eddie's. They buy 10% or 5% of the stock, whatever the number, exact number is, and they take over Crazy Eddie's in a, in a proxy battle. And to be fair, we warned them off, but they wanted the company. Why did they take over a company with little due diligence? They didn't have access to the books and records. As I said to you before the break, I never failed an audit. They relied upon the integrity of financial sta the financial statements as audited by KPMG. And we see investors time and time rely upon audits. Audits by their nature are not designed to find collusive fraud. At best, they're like the spell checker on Microsoft Word to catch innocent typos. That is the reality. When auditors go into court, the first defense is we're not, we're, not, we're not there to find this kind of fraud. Every single accounting firm plays the same game. The reality is, <coughs> is that we don't do audits. It's a lie. The word audit is a lie. We do limited reviews of financial statements to see if they comply with generally accepted accounting principles. We don't look, they don't look for fraud. They don't look for fraud. So the reality is, is that the use of the word audit gives investors a false sense of security because they're not audits anyway. They never will be. He brought us up to be crooks, Eddie. He put everything I did came, came from you, Eddie. Okay? Now, I don't blame myself, but everything I did came, I learned from you. Well, 
The rooms were bust. Just weeks after taking over the chain, Palmieri discovered empty warehouses and inflated earnings. The SEC, the U.S. Postal Service, and the Justice Department came crashing in. Sam, under fire from all sides, found himself alone. Eddie, he was long gone. He was a tanky pony specialist. He already moved most of his sons overseas. Eddie Antar is a fugitive from justice. And eventually, when a judge wanted him to appear for a court order, he skipped town altogether. Judge Colleton ordered federal marshals to spare no expense in nailing the elusive Antar. Paul Weissman, a former U.S. attorney, prosecuted the case. His boss, Michael Chertoff, now Secretary of Homeland Security, described Eddie Antar as the Darth Vader of capitalism. Together, they got Sam to flip. He would avoid prison by testifying against his own family. In every big case, there needs to be uh, at least one person who knows the story, can explain it to the prosecutors, and explain it to the jury. In the Crazy Eddie case, that was Sam. This yes. is a family known for loyalty, correct? Yes. You were loyal all the way through, to the end. And you turned around yes. and turned on your family. Yes, I put them all in jail. So every day he would come in and there'd be some new disclosure he would make, some new twist and turn that you then had to corroborate somehow, correct? Yes. Or at least make every effort to corroborate. Right. It was difficult, as I said, because virtually all the records had been shredded. We destroyed them all the time. We never kept copies of anything. Routinely shredding documents. Routinely shredding documents. One time the SEC was on company premises. I was shredding in one room. They were broken in the other room. So Crazy Eddie explodes in 1987. And there was a two-year period where I was stonewalling the government investigations, perjuring myself under oath, putting my right hand up like that, the left hand on the Bible, whatever. I'm lying under oath. I'm helping other co-conspirators lie under oath. And I find myself in the middle of a family battle. Eddie's ready to leave town. He's getting ready to leave town. And the estranged part of the Antar family that he was fighting with, they're all pointing at me. So I do the self-preservation thing. I go to work for the United States government. I say, I surrender. I surrender. Now, I did not cooperate with the United States government because of any remorse. I didn't give a damn about my victims. I did not cooperate with the United States government because I felt guilty for my crimes. I just didn't want to sit down and pick up, I didn't want to bend down in prison, pick up a bar of soap and worry who, about the guy that was behind me, if you get my drift. It was totally a self-interested thing. I only cooperated because I wanted to save my own skin. And the United States government needed my cooperation because as much as they want, as much as they tried, there wasn't much in the way of physical evidence available to help them make a case without me. And in 1989, when I'm walking into the door of the United States government to the US Attorney's Office, they know nothing about the skimming before the company went public. They know nothing about the gradual reduction in skimming. They had only known that Eddie took his so-called legitimately made money, his on-the-books money from the stock, and transferred it overseas. They didn't know anything about secret bank accounts in Israel. So when I go into the United States Attorney's Office in 1989, they have the now, now they have the fraud full circle. They had to cut a deal with somebody who did fraud for 16 years, lied in their faces for two years, destroyed all of the evidence, or pretty much the evidence, that could be used against his, their co his fellow co-conspirators. And still, we were able to cut a deal. The moral of the story is, is that in, in our system of justice, in order to properly investigate white collar crimes and put other criminals in jail, you need the cooperation of some criminals to catch others. An FBI agent testifying about our conspiracy does not have the same credibility, believe it or not, in front of a jury than a lying, low-life co-conspirator. So it was basically a horse trade. I'm going to sell you what? Information that you don't have. 
the victims will be able to recover whichever monies are available a lot faster. They won't have to wait 10 years for their money. They'll recover it maybe two or three years. And instead of recovering $100 million, I mean, instead of recovering $20 million, you can recover $100 million. So they make, they cut a deal with me. I plead guilty to three felonies. And ultimately, I get a slap on the wrist and house arrest for my crimes. $30,000 in fines and disgorgement from the SEC and the Justice Department. A complete walk on civil liability from every single victim. Imagine the victim screaming that we committed this massive fraud, but their lawyers knew, because their lawyers get paid on a contingency basis, that if they didn't cut a deal with me, the victims can yell and scream all they want. Sammy Antal will be in prison, but you'll be a lot poorer. So they make a deal with me, almost in tandem with the US Attorney's Office, and I get a complete walk on all civil liability. 30,000 in fines, six months of house arrest for helping engineer a $500 million fraud, all because I had valuable information to sell the United States government. Ultimately, Eddie's arrested in Israel in 1992. He's brought back in 1993 in chains. And then you have the civil trial. You see, not every co-conspirator could be indicted on criminal charges. Famous O.J. Simpson case, right? He, law he won the criminal case for murder, but he lost the civil case for murder. So what do we call him, a civil murderer or a criminal murderer? Because under our system of justice, to convict somebody in a criminal case, you have to have evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's kind of saying you have to be 95% sure that the person is guilty. In a civil case, it's kind of like an election. You just got to win out, you have to have a preponderance of evidence, 51%. So the Antar family members that were not tried in the criminal case were convicted in civil cases. And because most of the money that the Antar family made was in the last two or three or four years of the fraud, most of the money was recoverable. In fact, the Antar family made about 90 million or so off the stock pre-tax and the government collects from the Antar family more than that amount, 95, 100 million, something like that, from the Antar family from seizing their assets. They collect more from the Antar family than they made after tax and possibly pre-tax from the securities fraud because of all of the skimming and everything else that had gone on and the other enterprises that they controlled outside of Crazy Eddie's. In the Crazy Eddie case, the shareholders get back 30 to 40 cents on the dollar approximately. Now, why if you collect more money from the Antars than they made off the securities fraud, why do the shareholders only end up with 30%? Well, when the stock goes from zero to 500, not only are the Antars making money from the fraud, but you have a lot of people that trade the stock that have nothing to do with the fraud. And they're making money as the stock goes up. Those people don't have to disgorge their profits. In a Ponzi scheme, like Bernie Madoff, right, the trustee in bankruptcy can actually sue people that made money from the Ponzi scheme, even though they weren't direct participants in the fraud. In securities fraud cases, you can't. So the other investors that made money at, as the Antoff family was making money, they don't have to give that money to the investors that lost money. And in its time, Crazy Eddie's was the, one of the top, was the top, it probably still is, percentage recoveries in a class action case involving securities fraud. Usually investors get two, three, four cents on the dollar. So how does Eddie get caught? Authorities get their break two years later when Eddie, needing money, comes to Geneva and attempts to withdraw funds from one of his secret accounts. To his surprise, he learns that the account has been frozen. I think there was about $3 million in that account. And Eddie evidently was not happy that it was frozen. 
and he's attempts to recover the money fail. He leaves empty handed. But the Swiss contact American law enforcement, who trace his theft back to Israel. He was caught when he left the apartment and he started driving and they had a female police officer who was wearing a micro mini dress and no underwear and bent over the hood of the car exposing herself, knowing Eddie couldn't resist. He stopped, he got out, he patted her on the ass, said, that's a great ass, and she said, you're a wreck. And Ed cocked it. <laughs> Jailed in Israel, Eddie Ansar loses his fight to avoid extradition and is sent back to America to face justice. Eventually, Ansar admits the 17 counts of fraud. He owes $150 million in fines and restitution, and close to $1 billion in civil lawsuits. He goes to prison for eight years. He hurt investors. He hurt creditors. He hurt consumers that might have lost their refunds. He hurt people that work for us that lost their jobs. There are countless other people who got hurt directly or indirectly from the fraud that we committed. You have to think of it as the Sephardic Jewish good fellows. There were a pack of thieves. The whole family was a pack of thieves. And uh, there's no honor in those thieves. Eddie could have been uh, an extremely successful businessman uh, who could have gone on to even bigger things. Eddie was like a force of nature, but like a tornado, when it was over, there was nothing but wreckage left. And all too unfortunate, after most frauds unravel, there's really nothing but wreckage left. Investors don't get that lucky. Sometimes they're lucky to get even five cents, two cents, even a penny on the dollar. So how do you spot the next crazy Eddies? What are the simple tools without getting into a whole semester of work. What, why didn't people use these tools? One of these tools is known as DSI. In Crazy Eddie's case, our inventory levels were growing three times the amount of revenues. And you can see here from this chart that before we went public when we were not inflating our inventories because we were understating income, we were about 68, 69 days. The first year that we went public, we marginally inflated our inventories, and we were at 69 days. But as we inflate our inventories more and more and more, we're at 80 to 112 days. And this man, financial analyst, who ran his own boutique independent research firm, not Wall Street research, he flags it. Now, today, I don't know if any of you read the financial press, there's a lot of battles between short sellers and companies. Short sellers bet that company stock are going to go down, and they love a good fraud. Because if a company is a fraud and the stock tanks, they make the money because they sell the stock before they buy it. So if they sell the stock at 20 and the stock tanks to 3, they buy it at $3 a share, they have a $17 profit. And many of these companies attack short sellers. They, try, they even sue them. They even try to get the SEC to investigate them for market manipulation. And from time to time, it doesn't happen often, short sellers, some short sellers, do in fact end up getting slapped by the SEC, but most are legitimate. They're very good at catching what they do, and they don't have access to the books and records of the companies that they're targeting. Neither did Thornton or Glove. He did that simple equation. He flagged us, but everybody ignored him. Nobody really listened to Thornton or Glove. Why? Because as criminals, we learned if we attack a critic, you're putting them on a pedestal. You're giving them the microphone. 
So unlike other companies that are vocal against short sellers, that make complaints against them, that sue them for libel in court and things like that, we decided the best course of action was is just to simply ignore him. And because we ignored him, everybody else did too. New Skin Enterprises, a $5 billion market cap company about a year ago. Multi-level marketing, which is sleazy in itself, but not for today's subject. I have a blog. I do professional work that I don't write about. And every once in a while, I decide I'm going to do my own financial analysis of a company just to show off, just to show you that I still have that accounting knowledge. So I do the same analysis that Thornton O. Globe does on Crazy Eddie's on a company called Newskin. And if you look, Newskin's inventory took 100 days to turn over in 2011, all the way up to 346 days about three years later. And during this period of time, Newskin is beating its own revenue estimates. In other words, if they tell Wall Street they're going to do 150, they do 160. And if you're beating your own estimates, at the end of the quarter, you should have less inventory on hand because you had those unexpected added sales than more inventory on hand. So I did the computations. Me, Sammy Antar. I'm not a genius. Any accounting student, anybody here, knowing the computations could have did the same thing. And I put it in my blog. I said, Newskin may have to take a significant margin reduction to unload its excess inventory and possibly have to recognize a material impairment charge against inventory in a future period. And I said that on July 22nd, 2014. Right? Voila. August 6, 2014, almost two weeks later, Newskin announces a $50 million inventory impairment. The stock tanks from $5 billion down to, say, $4 billion or $3.8 billion. It tanked 25%, wipes out over a billion dollars of market value in one day. Forget about if the company is a fraud or not, even though the, the SEC is investigating. Forget about the auditors. What about the institutional investors that hire MBAs out of the best schools in the country? And they're supposed to analyze these companies. They're supposed to be armed with the same tool that Sammy Antar used, right? They're supposed to be more intelligent than Sammy Antar because they're not criminals. Well, maybe criminals have the edge on intelligence, but that's another story. But the point being is, where were they? Why did they get their pants caught short? Because most people don't even use the simple tools available to them to look for the red flags. And we see this time and time again. All of the major fraudsters of the last century never lost an audit. And most of these companies that went belly up all had buy recommendations from Wall Street research. Wall Street research analysis as, as opposed to independent boutique firms that do their own independent analysis and short sellers. That's the unfortunate circumstance we have today. Going back to Crazy Eddie's. And going back to the general lesson about reading financial statements. Financial statements aren't meant to be read from page 1 to page 50. They're meant to be read from page 50 to page 1. You should not even touch the financial statements until you read the footnotes that describe them. Because in those footnotes are the qualitative jewels that might lead you to, to spot and identify red flags. Tucked in Crazy A's footnotes was two words, two change words, that enable us to understate our liabilities by $20 million and increase our net income by $20 million in 1987. Back in 1986, purchase discounts and trade allowances were recognized when received. In other words, if we had a volume rebate coming from, say, Panasonic of $20 million, right? We wouldn't recognize that on our books until Panasonic sends us an acknowledgment. Received. In 87, I changed one word. Received to earn. Purchase discounts and trade allowances are recognized when earned. One word. That means that 
I don't have to wait for that credit acknowledgement to come from Panasonic. The fact that I've already earned it, the mere fact that the paperwork hasn't arrived is really a formality. I can now book that discount and increase my income. Now, the immediate effect of something like that is that you're recognizing these discounts faster. There's less of a time lag, but there was m something more sinister involved. If I don't have to wait for a credit acknowledgement to come from a vendor, right? I can fill out a, my own phony form saying a credit acknowledgement is due from the vendor. And it's the auditor's job, if Crazy 80s says, well, we're owed $20 million in credit acknowledgements, it's called debit memos. We write a debit memo saying that we have these $20 million in credit acknowledgements coming to us. It's the auditor's job to verify those debit memos claiming those credit acknowledgements. 1987, we write out $20 million in phony debit memos. Our accounts payable, which should have been $70 million, was reported at $50 million. In other words, we understated our accounts payable by 30%. And you'll ask, why did the auditors miss it? Now, remember what I said to you about stalling without them accusing you of stonewalling? I'm going to show you this deposition transcript, and I'll go back to the numbers in a second. This is the PMM. At that time, Maine Herdman was then known as Pete Marwick, Maine, before it became known as KPMG. This is the PMM staffer that audited the accounts payable of Crazy Eddie's, where we understated our accounts payable by $20 million. There's a date at the bottom of the page, which appears to be April 27th, 1987. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. What does it signify? It was my policy to date my work papers when I began to perform audit work. He dated his work papers on accounts payable when he began to perform his audit work, and that was April 28, 1987. Coincidentally, that was the same day that KPMG, or PMM, as it was known then, gave us a clean audit opinion. Our fiscal year ended March 1, 1987. So between March 1, 1987 and April 28, 1987, he did nothing on accounts payable. Now, how can he verify $20 million in debit memos, in phony debit memos, in a single day? And why were we able to accomplish it? Young kid, male, 25 years old, six months out of college, and he learned about debit and credit memos from me. He was too busy paying attention to the females. You see, it could have been flagged because if you look over here, generally speaking, our accounts payable to inventory ratio is between 75 and 86% over the years. In the year that we understated our accounts payable by 20 million, the ratio goes down to 45%. The problem that we have today, going back to the subject of audits, is, is that if you look at study after study by the Association of S Certified Fraud Examiners, only between 3 and 5% of frauds are flagged by external auditors. Now, they're not lazy. In some cases, they are. Just like you have lazy criminals, and you have lazy cops, and you have lazy everything. There's always bad apples in every bunch. You can't help that. But if you look at the top discoverer, the top way that fraud is exposed, you'll see that it's by tip. 40 to 43% of fraud is exposed by tip. And if you go down three lines, between 6 and 7% by accident. Majority of frauds are exposed by tips or accident. The second level, which is management review or internal audit, they really could be one combined levels, 28%, and you go on and on and on. 
the reality is, is that no matter how much money we spend on audits, how much, money, how much time is spent trying to make auditors do better jobs, no matter how much money we spend on compliance and make internal auditors do better job, the reality is with all the money that's spent, plus the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and all of the reforms that came after the financial meltdowns in the, in the early millennium, the reality is still that most fraud is uncovered because somebody outside the system rats out somebody else. Can it be changed? There was a time that I thought it could be changed. There was a time that I thought that auditors could be made better, whether they're internal auditors or external auditors. But you know something? I'm not throwing in the towel. Well, to me, it's just, I just see a different reality. The reality is, is that audits have their limitations. Compliance has its limitations. If you want to make it not have its limitations, then allow compliance officers to uh, open up your safes, go into your mattresses, go into your lives. We're not going to go there. We're never going to go there as a society. The reality is, is that everything that we have in place to protect investors has its limitations. Going back, who are these tipsters? Are they these altruistic human beings out to right the world from all the wrongs? Once in a while you get a Cynthia Cooper, I think, with WorldCom, genuine person, stumbles into something. But those kind of things happen very few times. They glamorize in the movies. But the reality is, is that most fraud is discovered because of the three X's. It's actually a term that the IRS uses. I didn't invent this term. It's not pornography, but it's pretty close. Ex-lovers, ex-business associates, and ex-employees. Most fraud is be be discovered because somebody out there has an ax to grind, has an agenda. And pretty much today, our system of catching white-collar criminals relies on these embittered people. No matter how much money that we spend on compliance and controls and everything else. And again, they're not motivated by altruism. They're motivated by getting even. See, the PCAOB say, OK, how good are audits given all of what Sammy Antar said? Well, the PCAOB does inspections of audits conducted by the big four accounting firms and other smaller accounting firms. And you will see continually, year after year, between 21 and 48, between 21 and 50 percent of audits conducted by major, the big four accounting firms are deficient. They don't even do their jobs in the audits that they're doing. This year, 2014, got a little bit better, but let's see what happens in 2015. Worse, federal law enforcement, FBI referrals of white-collar cases to prosecutors has actually gone down. These are the Clinton years. These are the Bush years. In the Obama years, it started to go up, but it, st it started fading down. More closely at the numbers is this interesting thing. 1993 was the Crazy Eddie trial, where Eddie was facing trial for criminal charges. In 2013, 20 years later, when this study was conducted, the government, the FBI was referring 55% less cases to prosecutors than it was when, arguably, I was a criminal. Now, in those 20 years, the U.S. economy grew by leaps and bounds. Now, do any of us really believe, we don't have to prove it in here, in, in our own educated opinions that crime has gone down? The reality is, is that the government doesn't have the resources to fight white-collar crime. If you look at some numbers here, I live in New York City. New York City is a city of 8 million people. 
we have 34,000 cops walking the beat. One year could be 33,000, 35,000, but 30, 34,000 or so cops walking the beat. The FBI only employs about 14,000, 13,600 special agents. Not all of them do white collar crime. The IRS, Criminal Investigative Division, about 2,600 special agents. The SEC, about 4,000 people in its totality. That includes clerks. I couldn't get an exact breakdown of how many people were in the enforcement division. The US Postal Inspector's Office, 1,500 postal inspectors. We have more cops fighting blue collar crime on the streets of New York than the federal government has nationwide fighting white collar criminals. So the criminals in America are going to have the edge. There is no doubt about it. So I want to just show you another video, if I can. It's too long. Hold on. So the same crimes that I've committed over and over are going to continually happen again. I want to show you one example of Congressman Michael Grimm. Remember when we learned about the Crazy Eddie skimming, right? You think that skimming has stopped? Michael Grimm is a Republican congressman, was a Republican congressman. He's in jail now for about a year or so on income tax evasion. Michael Grimm did some of the techniques that we did at Crazy Eddie's, except he made one mistake. Michael Grimm put his evidence on Excel spreadsheets, sent it out through emails, and it was stored on various computers. If you, first thing you should learn when, if you're ever going to do crime is what? Never leave an audit trail. So here's me blasting Michael Grimm. Start from the beginning. Oh, this is the Israeli bank thing. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me start again. Michael Grimm. Michael Grimm does not know how to destroy the record. What's the difference between the politics and the white collar criminal record? If you just keep the second set of books, you don't put it on an Excel spreadsheet that could be retrieved by a forensic expert. That's mistake number one. Number two is you don't email your second set of books, figures from your second set of books to somebody. That's mistake number two. Third mistake, okay, is you never pay people entirely it's easier to lie about how much somebody is getting paid than to lie about whether or not they were employed by you. It would have been more difficult to indict. No criminal is ever supposed to leave the border trail. Here, the government has a paper trail matching the crime. There's no difference between a politician and a white collar criminal. They're one and the same. This idiot, okay, he went to Congress to serve the people, and he delegates his tax crimes to somebody else to carry out. If you're going to delegate it, you delegate it to people that you trust. When I was a crook, the most dangerous thing that I worried about was a squealer within my ranks. Now, the swamp's so dangerous. The story is, I made this momentary lapse in judgment. You know, I never was a premeditated crook. I never wanted to set out to write a crime. And then he's going to flood the judge with all of these letters from his constituents. He walked an old lady across the street. He kissed the baby in the baby stroller. He gave money to charity. Hopefully for him, the judge is going to have a heart to say, you know, he's really not a bad guy. Maybe instead of getting 10 years in prison, maybe he'll get three or two or three years in prison. That's what's going to happen next. And the only reason why he's going to be singing the song that I'm really a nice guy is because he got caught with his pants down. And he pled guilty to it. Michael Grip. Now. You might ask, what happened with these Israeli banks that were helping us loan the money? Why weren't they prosecuted? Here's a picture of one of the secret bank accounts with the deposit in there. And if you notice somewhere over here, let me just see, it says no mail. Somewhere on this document it says no mail because we didn't want it, the bank statements from Israel coming into the United States and getting in, uh, intercepted. Not one single foreign bank, Israeli or otherwise, was ever indicted or censured for helping us launder money and evade taxes. Not one, until almost a generation later. Bank Liumi was the same bank where we, that we used 
to, loan, to, to, to ferret out our assets, our cash assets, and put it into the bank there. It was the same bank that we used to loan the money back into the United States. And they did pretty much the same crimes. They were accused 30 years later of the same crimes they helped us do with Crazy Eddie's. So Bank Liuvi eventually has to face several hundred million dollars in fines for assisting clients like they assisted us at Crazy Eddie's, and this is 30 years later. 30 years later. So don't assume that the government is even coordinated. One agency doesn't talk to another. One division, see, division within an agency never talks to another. And with that, I conclude my presentation by saying these words from Mark Twain. A man is never more truthful than when he acknowledges himself a liar. And me here, I am a liar. So therefore, you can ask me, if you'd like, any question that you have. If I can't answer it, I'll just simply lie. And also, the statute of limitations has expired on all my crimes, so I have no incentive not to lie. Anybody want to ask any questions? Please go right ahead. Do I have any remorse? Yes, I have remorse that I got caught. <laughs> Next question. Without, all right, his question was, I'm just saying for the virtue of the camera, without knowing that I was going to get off the hook, why didn't, I, why, why didn't I flee like Eddie? Because I loved my children, Eddie didn't. <laughs> Seriously. He didn't love his children, or as much as I love my children. More questions? Yes? Seeing the interviews? No, doesn't. Doesn't. No effect. He asked me, seeing the interviews, does it have any kind of effect on me? The answer is no. Next. You. I'll stay here for everybody's question. Go ahead. I think I can trust somebody to commit a crime with me outside of race, religion, ethnicity. I give, let's put it, I give the edge to race, religion, and ethnicity. If I'm going to commit a crime, I'm going to commit a crime with per people from the same heritage as me. Because I know, now we get into science or into demographics, that the most successful criminal groups have those three characteristics in common. Shared race, religion, and ethnicity. More questions. Go ahead, sir. He's asking if I have a relationship with the rest of the family. And I will tell you that every Hanukkah, they throw darts at my picture. <laughs> what? My children? Now, my children, she asked me if I was able to restore the relationship with my children. Actually, in, 
a, a, a very important question. I'll explain to you why. <coughs> I started out when I was 14 years old at Crazy Eddie's. By the time I was head into this thing as the chief financial officer of the company, I was about 27, 28 years old, give or take. I was married at 22, so when I was going through it, my children were basically infants. By the time I got out of it, okay, by the time I finished my house arrest in 1994, my eldest child was 10, I had one that was 8, and one that was uh, six or, or seven. So in other words, it, it didn't have that effect because it didn't impact their lives because they were very, very young. Now, when they went to college, they always would bring their dad for show and tell, my dad the felon. And I give out, the, so I'm not kidding you, yeah, my nieces and nephews are the same thing. So because it didn't have a negative impact during their formative years, they don't view me with, say, the same hostility that the other Antars who had elder children that were growing up at the time. So to them, it had no effect on them. So I didn't have that, you know, children problem at the time. Yes? Did the, I think it was 30 something stores, did y'all keep? 43 by the end, yeah. Did you keep someone in the, with the family at each store, or how did that kind of work? <laughs> Well, as it got bigger, we couldn't, didn't have enough family members to spread around the 43 stores. And uh, most of the store openings were when we were a public company. By that time, we'd stopped skimming. Uh, the inventory inflations didn't have to go on in all 43 stores. So we would uh, do inflations of inventories or in areas where we had people we could trust as opposed to areas where we had people we could not trust. Yeah. It's not just a matter of how many stores that they audited or uh, it's how deep they went and they never really went more than skin deep. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like evaluating a car by just looking at it through the showroom glass. They didn't get into the engine. And even when they did open up the hood, they really didn't get inside to the parts and take them and see what really made that car run. Yes. Do we ever have a sales consultant? Oh, yeah, we had plenty of sales tax audits. And yeah, they catch a couple of things here and there, but nothing like, you know, more like clerical errors, nothing that related to us having unreported sales. So we never had that kind of um, an assessment from sales tax department that related to, you would call it a fraud assessment, so to speak. It's like me. I never got audited by the Internal Revenue Service until this year, considering my history. <laughs> never got audited by the Internal Revenue Service until this year. Even through everything, I got my first audit, and it was just on T&E for the last three years. And when I looked at it, and I said, I traveled out of town 75 times in three years. I said, I might have to have my head examined. Go ahead. More questions? Yeah. What I suggest to make, make them more effective, I have a different approach. Some people might think it radical. Some people might think of it raising the white flag and saying we give up. I don't think any amount of audit work, OK? And there's exceptions to any rule. So this is not an absolutist argument. Sometimes auditors get lazy and they're frauds they should have caught, like crazy eddies. But I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of the time the criminals will always have the edge, and no matter how much work that the auditors do, they're just not going to catch it. So my solution to the problem is to take the word audit out of the accounting profession's dictionary. Okay, first of all, we never say audit target, we say audit client. And that in of itself seems like um, a conflict. It doesn't make sense. How can you have an audit client? It should be an audit target. The reality is, is that audit is not the work that they do for assurance at year end, to verify that the financial accounts are in coins account. They do a limited review of financial information. And if, I believe that if the accounting profession manned up and said, listen, 
we're going to call it limited reviews. There would not be so many black eyes on the profession. Some warranted, and many unwarranted, because that's not the work that they do. You can't say it's an audit and then say, well, this is what we mean by audit. It, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. So my thing really is more a truth and labeling solution rather than for us to spend more money on compliance and more money on audits or anything else. I believe that it's a battle that cannot be won. That's just my opinion. If I, if I was in this room three years earlier or four years earlier, I would have had a completely different opinion. So my thoughts on it have changed. More questions. Back there. If I had kept the company private, well, before we went public, there were debates within the Antal family. Yes, if we had kept the company private, how long could we have gone? I think the biggest mistake we did was to go public. The second mistake we did, okay, even if we went public, I think we could have sustained this if we'd gone straight after going public. All we needed, we could have committed the perfect crime, skim, gradual reduction in skimming, and just let the numbers fall where they fall after we went public. We would have committed the perfect crime in going public. We would have maybe pocketed 50 million instead of 100 million, but we got greedy. We kept on building upon our previous successes. It's kind of like this. Everybody is in this classroom now because of previous successes, right? If you're a, soph if you're a sophomore, you're here because you were a freshman last year. And nobody in this classroom is, is banking on failure or expects themselves to fail. You take precautions against it, but nobody here is planning on failure. The same mindset applies to the criminal. We thought that if we were successful at 15 years of fraud and this level of sophistication, we're going to get to the next level of sophistication until we, real, until we hit the brick wall, so to speak. More questions? No more questions. And I thank you all for having me here. I really do. By the way, I've quit the speaking circuit after this. 75 in three years, I did that need I had examined. <laughs>